So the next Thank talk you. is uh, by Professor Gautam Menon. So Professor Gautam Menon is uh, again a theoretical physicist and um, he is uh, a professor in Ashoka University, one of the um, upcoming liberal arts college in India. And he's also a professor in Indian Institute of Math, um, Math Science. Um, and um, yeah, he has been in this field for long and one of the leading um, epidemiologists in India. And uh, in the recent COVID time, he has been working and making a lot of uh, impressions. And uh, so we are here to listen from you. How is your experience? Thank you, Nilay. Thank you, Nilay Wolfgang and Mega for this invitation to speak here. Let me share my screen. I will assume that you can now see my screen. So I want to describe epidemiological models for COVID-19 in the specific context of India, although you can generalize it for any country, given what we know. So let me just give you some of the numbers about COVID-19 at the moment. So over here, you see six countries, India, United States, Brazil, United Kingdom, Spain, South Korea. And this is the integrated number of cases that they've seen right up to, I think, pretty much about a week ago. Look at the way the number of cases for India has risen very, very, very sharply. This is far sharper than you can see for any of the other countries that you've seen here. Currently, in terms of the total number of cases, India is just behind the United States, somewhat ahead of Brazil. But the incredible speed at which the, the most recent, the second wave of cases in India took off has really been responsible for a lot of problems that India has had in terms of its health systems being completely overwhelmed by the numbers of cases. So right now, India has about 28 million cases. The US around 35 million cases. Brazil is probably smaller than that by a factor of about two or something. So that's, that's where we all stand at the moment. This is what the Indian epidemic or the Indian experience of COVID-19 has looked like. That's a curve below. And the curve on the top is just the integrated number of cases that you get from integrating this curve from the right, from the left, right up to any point on the right hand side. So India has seen two waves of COVID-19. The first wave peaked around the middle of September, as you can see. And that peak was at about 98,000 cases per day at the maximum. Then cases went down for a long time until about the middle of February, when which the point they began to start to rise again. And then they rose very, 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 very steeply. By about early April, we had crossed the earlier limit of, of about 98,000, the earlier peak of 98,000. And then it rose very, very sharply to a number of about four, more than 410,000 cases per day. It's an incredible number. And it stayed at that level for about a week to two weeks. And then equally fast, it's begun its trend downward. Right now, India is, is recording a little under 100,000 cases per day. That is still a number that is larger than anywhere else. So it's still, the Indian epidemic is still larger in size at the moment in terms of daily cases than anywhere else in the world. But hopefully we will see that downtrend continuing for a little more time. It seems as though at least this part of it is over. We have seen the downtrend in the second wave and we'll have to see what happens next. So. These are the numbers here, as I said, 29 million in terms of cases and about 355,000 deaths, 355, deaths is what we've seen. An interesting thing that is responsible for this earlier curve, the first dip and then the very, very sharp rise has been the new variants of, of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is a virus that causes COVID-19. Of course, there is a discussion, I'm sure, in, in Germany, in Europe, over much of Europe, South Africa, many other countries, as to how do we understand the nature of the new variants. There are about four or five what are called variants of interest and variants of concern, which have now sort of spread across the world because they are important because they just simply seem to spread faster and more efficiently than earlier variants. So currently, the variant that everyone is worrying now about now it's called the Delta variant. It used to be called the Indian variant. It used to be called the B1617 variant. But right now, the acceptable term for it is the Delta variant so that it doesn't name a country specifically. And the Delta variant has pretty much taken over all of the viral diversity in India. It's very become very important to the UK. The US is seeing a rise in cases from there. So this presumably will be the talk of the town, will be the point that we'll have to discuss in the future. What happens with new variants? Can new variants come and lead to a rise, a further rise in the number of cases between the second wave and a potential third wave? How does one think about that? Can we begin to model when a new variant might rise? Of course, one way to understand variants is that the more people there are who are infected, the more reasons there are, the more ways there are in which a virus can mutate. 
once having mutated, it can mutate to a more successful, more easily transmissible version, and that can take over less transmissible, transmissible versions. So one thing is, of course, just to worldwide to reduce the number of cases. And the way we know that is, of course, through non-pharmaceutical interventions, through vaccinations, and so on. The Indian vaccination uh, scheme, the Indian vaccination program, started on the 16th of January of this year. There have been a bunch of policy changes in between. The first, when it started off, it was intended only for those above 60. Then it was extended to those above 45 with comorbidities. Then after that, relaxed to anyone over 45. And right now, it's open to anyone in the gap between 18 and above. So 18 to 45 is the newest little age group that is now being filled by vaccinations. Currently, India has vaccinated about 20% of the eligible population with at least one dose. And with two doses, the number is probably around 5 or 6%. So it's much smaller than that. But at least there is partial protection for 20% of the eligible population, eligible being the population above 18 in this particular case. India currently vaccinates around 3 million people per day. That is, by most European standards, a very, very large number. That's, you know, within, within about 10 days to 20 days, you'd get to the population of any reasonably sized European country. But because India is so large, this is still a fairly slow process. There's a lot of discussion at the moment whether we can push the 3 million up to something like 10 million or 12 million. The big question here is the question that I get asked many times, um, almost once a day, if not more, is what happens next? Is there a third wave in the offing? So here is data from South Africa, where you can see the beginnings of a third wave. You see a well-defined first wave, a well-defined second wave, and then you can see the curve beginning to go up. South Africa has a population of about 60 million compared to, a, to, to a 100, 138 million. Uh, sorry, 1,380 million for India, so very, very different in, in scale. And only about 1% of South Africans have been vaccinated. So that's why you can see that this is a sort of disaster waiting to happen. It's a case where people are not protected by vaccinations and where numbers are going up inexorably, and there seems to be no way to control that, that, that sudden increase. So I'll come back to this example of why 60 million is, is interesting to me for a particular reason. I want to tell you about three models that we worked on. One is called Inside Sim. And inside SIM is an epidemiological compartmental model for India. I'll tell you a little bit about what these models are. I'll tell you a little bit about networks models, in which we've been using to understand testing in a low and a middle income country. And then I will tell you about the Bharat SIM program, which is a sort of large scale, somewhat open ended program in which to understand the, the nature of agent based models for disease. So I'll let you I'll fill you in a little bit about what these models do, what these models are like and what they attempt to ask, what questions they attempt to answer. Before we do that, I just want to define two terms that are important. In fact, the second term is not particularly important, but you will see both these terms in any literature on epidemiology, in any discussion of COVID-19. The first is called the infection fatality ratio. And as, as you can see from the word, it, is fat it has infection in it, it has fatality in it, it has ratio in it. It's a simple ratio of the number of deaths divided by the number of infections. So that's a number that typically if if everyone died who was infected, that would be 100%. If there was only a small number of people who died as a consequence of infections, that would be much smaller than 100%. This is not the same as something called the case fatality ratio, which is the number of deaths divided by the number of diagnosed cases. The difference is that it's subtle. The denominator is different in this. The first denominator is the number of infections, whether you find them or not. The second is the number of cases, which means that you have to test for them and look for the people who test positive. So the denominator here is the number of people who test positive for COVID-19. The numerator is the same in both of these. And the reason that they're not the same is really a property of COVID-19. That is, you have many, many people who will be infected with COVID-19, but will not show symptoms of COVID-19. Because of that, the infection fatality ratio is much smaller than the case fatality ratio. And the infection fatality ratio is believed to be, in a sense, characteristic of a disease, although there's an overlay on top of it by the nature of the healthcare system. How sure can you be that someone who enters a hospital and with a, with a treatable form of COVID-19 does not die because they don't get treatment or oxygen in time? The reason that, that discussion is interesting is because there have been a number of improvements in care for COVID-19 over the period of the first wave. So we've, we've, just, we've understood that simply asking the patient to lie down on their stomach for a while, this is called pronation, improves their outcomes because it helps their breathing. 
the fact that you should not have mechanical ventilation allowing people to breathe using using a mechanical device that supplies oxygen from out you should delay that as much as possible the use of steroids at exactly the right time in the treatment can prevent a worse situation for infection and overall less invasive therapies that is the fact that covid-19 for most people if you don't interview interfere too much will get better you only have to concentrate on the small fraction of people who will get potentially worse if they don't get the right right kind of treatment this suggests that if you look at the ifr the infection fatality rate between the beginning of of when covid-19 entered india or entered any country and much later that number should be different it should have gone down because we simply know how to treat covid-19 better and now we know that we can treat precisely people who would have died earlier because we weren't treating them in the correct manner we had initially low levels of testing so there was little public awareness largely asymptomatic patients were not being tested but testing has increased over the last year or so so the the case detection has increased and therefore the gap between the number of cases that you think you have and the number of true infections has now begun to shrink so that's another thing that models must be aware of the fact that these quantities are not static in time but they can potentially change finally other types of interventions such as vaccinations testing etc have been increased there's already some level of people who have been infected in the population this is called the sero prevalence so now we're in a situation where a number of people have already been infected now the question is how many people were infected are you talking about 20, 10% or 20% or 30% or 40% what is the different impact of having a vaccination program that you introduce when already you have 30% of people infected or 50% of people infected or just 10% of people infected so exactly how you turn on and turn off intervention for example a lockdown in a city preventing people from going to bars introducing an early night curfew 9 o'clock instead of 11 o'clock as fernando mentioned earlier you can look at these effects of different strategies and that's exactly where models are very useful so let me start with telling you what goes into the model so this is work that so our work here with the insights and model was initiated with an organization called the Indian Scientists Response to COVID-19 this is a group that has around 600 to 700 scientists media people doctors etc a large group of people visual scientists communicators etc who have been working on this and a part of this group the ISRC is a group that develops models for covid-19 so here is a model that we have been working with that describes four categories of patients the first category of patient is someone who is when they're infected will be in asymptomatic they go to be being exposed to the disease to being infected asymptomatically with the disease and then to recovering and typically you don't stay asymptomatic for very long during that period you are infectious to other people you can be mildly diseased which means you go go from exposed to a state called presymptomatic presymptomatic is when you are infectious to other people but you don't show symptoms on your own then you move to the mildly symptomatic category where you have some symptoms for example a cough or a low grade fever and then you recover after that comes the severe and the critical cases a severe case will have to spend time in hospital he passes through the same pre symptomatic stage uh, uh, an intermediate severe and symptomatic stage a hospital stage and then recovers a critical patient will go through all of these stages including the hospital but then has it is possible that they need die at the end of this so the rates at which these you move, transition between these states the different balance between if you're infected are you asymptomatic mildly severely critical all of this is what goes into models here's what the specification of a model looks like for an epidemiologist so this is just writing out everything that i told you in the earlier slide in a little more formal manner the s stands for susceptible susceptible people if infected go at a certain rate to the exposed compartment once they're in the exposed compartment they bifurcate into either being asymptomatic or presymptomatic if they're asymptomatic which is the ia little box below they go straight to being recovered after some time if they pre symptomatic from there they can again branch out into being mildly symptomatic or severely symptomatic if they mildly symptomatic they recover after a while if they pre symptomatic and then they go to severely symptomatic they go to hospital from hospital they can either recover or they can die at some rate so the numbers that you see here the lambdas the rows the deltas etc are all features that characterize the disease and an epidemiologist looks at a figure like this and converts it mentally into a set of equations in his head and that's what those equations look like this is a much more complicated set of equation they have sub components i etc and i stands for age compartment so you can look at 0 to 10 10 to 20 20 to 30 30 to 40 because the impact of the disease is very differential across different ages the numbers to the right hand side also have contact so you have to understand what is the typical contact that a 20 year old might have for example with a 60 year old or an 80 year old or a 10 year old with a 20 year old and the contacts between between different age classes 
is of course something that sociologists and anthropologists measure. And that's something that has been measured in the literature, not very well, but that enters these models as well. So you can look at contacts in schools, at workplaces, at homes, and those are the quantity CIG that enter this particular description. So this is an epidemiological compartmental model. It's a set of, of, of nonlinear coupled differential equations with certain properties that, that make it interesting to study. Overall, this is a population whose total numbers don't change, except in the dead compartment, because then they're removed from the total number of the population. But oh, there are no births in this population, so there's no influx into the population that comes here from the number of births. So we study these equations in a fairly complicated manner. We accommodate changing IFRs, a changing fraction of people who are detected. We use Bayesian methodologies. We use a likelihood that weights both observed infections and observed deaths against the predictions. And we do a complicated thing, which I will refer you to the papers to look at. What we want to look at is what happened in India across the span of the first wave. As I said, this is a wave that peaked around the middle of September, and it went up to about 98,000, actually 97,860 cases, and then it came down. We're interested in the first wave because we want to know how many people were infected at the end of the first wave. That little box that you see there is a very stringent nationwide lockdown of about 70 days that the government of India actually included. There are various milestones, 100,000 cases, 10 million cases, et cetera, et cetera, that are listed over here, how many deaths, et cetera, when the vaccination started. This is an interesting graphic that has a lot of information inside it. If you look at the cases per capita across India, you can see a large distinction. So the lighter colors here are fewer cases per capita. The darker colors here are more cases per capita. I'm currently in that little black dot that you can see at the top. That's the city of Delhi. I'm a little outside the city of Delhi. I want to talk a bit about one particular state here, the state that you can see called Karnataka, because that will be used to benchmark some of the calculations that I will describe to you. So as I said, the questions are, how many people have been infected by the first wave in India? And we need to know that because we need to know how many people are left to be infected at the point when India reached its second wave. And what is the best estimate for the infection fatality ratio? The infection fatality ratio, which I explained to you a little earlier, is one of the most important quantities for an epidemiologist to think about. And that's because this determines, in a sense, the most concrete aspects of a disease, which is how many people die from it. Of course, there are other ways you could be severely, for example, you could be severely disabled by if you catch the disease. We're not worried about that. We're only looking at the deaths in this particular case. And that's why the IFR or the infection fatality ratio is important to us. So it's also important because there's an ongoing discussion. This is the New York Times from about two weeks ago, a very controversial article, which asked just how big could India's true COVID toll be? Are you counting the deaths correctly? Are you, are you misunderstanding the true toll of COVID-19, the true IFR, because you've not managed to count the number of deaths? There's a, there's a lot of of, of, of confusion about how, whether deaths are being recorded correctly or not as COVID-19 deaths. So that's one example of why we'd like to understand this number a little further. So I want to talk about some calculations and how they generalize <clears throat> based on Karnataka state. This is a state of India, which has about close to 70 million people. So it's already a fairly large by most European standards. It has an urban to rural ratio of about 40 to 60 from a census a few years ago. The number is probably a little more balanced as 50-50 right now. It has about 31 districts, and they're all somewhat different from each other, as we learn. The first thing that we wanted to do was to try and understand what level of death undercounting there was. And one way to do this was to first find a district where we believed the death counting was done somewhat properly. So we chose the capital district of this particular state because it has all of the hospitals in it, relatively well-educated, largely urban population. And we said that will be our benchmark because we'll use that to determine whether what is the right IFR that we must apply to obtain a consistency between the number of cases and the number of deaths, putting all the numbers into our, um, our model, as I said. Once you do that, then you can say, all right, suppose I know the number of cases, the actual number of infections from something called a zero survey. Can I go back and figure out how many deaths must have led to that many infections? Because I know what the IFR is. Once I do that, I can say, this is a place where I must be undercounting deaths because the discrepancy between the number of deaths that I expect and the number of deaths that I see is exactly that factor of undercounting. So we do this for all districts in Karnataka, and then we weight this by the, by the, by the, the population of each of these districts in order to try and figure out what might be the situation in a 60% rural, 40% urban situation in the country, which also somewhat miraculously happens to be the same urban to rural balance within India as a whole. So we said we will use this overall undercounting factor 
as a proxy measure for how much we're undercounting of the Indian states. So here's an example. Here is that state again. The darker colors here are more undercounting. So you can see that from these calculations, there are states that have been undercounting up by a factor of five, the total number of deaths. But there are other uh, there are other districts that have been, you know, maybe a factor of two, maybe a factor of three. Some of them between somewhere between one and two. So they're actually doing somewhat better in terms of undercounting. From here, we can wind up with predictions for how many people must have been infected at the end of the first wave by about the 15th of January. So between December and January, we can figure out. It doesn't seem to have changed very much between December and January because that was the point where the cases had really, really come down at that point. These numbers span all the way from about 70% to about 25%. So there's a very large gradient between more urban regions and more rural regions. Bangalore, which is very urban, is around 75%. You, Udupi, which is fairly urban, Davanagere, et cetera, et cetera, are all fairly large numbers over here. And we can try and understand what happens between an urban and a rural area in terms of these numbers. Having done that, we can now repeat this for multiple cases in, in India. We've looked at Bombay. So Bombay, large city, large Indian city, population around 16 million, depending upon how you count it. Multiple waves of the disease, a wave that went up, came down. So what the dots that you see on these plots are actual case counts on that particular day. It's not smoothed or anything. These are actual case counts that are obtained. The dots on the right-hand side is the number of deaths. So you can see the complexity of these curves, the curves that go up and down. The line that you can see through that is our best fit line. And the, and the gray bars here are the 95 and the 98% confidence intervals on these. There are multiple waves of cases, and these reflect in deaths. We can compute from here how many people must have been infected in Mumbai at the end of the first wave. And that number is somewhere between 60 and 70 percent, which is fairly large. We can look at the bias multiplier. What is the difference between the number of cases that you said were detected and the actual number of cases? And this number turns out to be somewhere around 20 to 30, 30 times. So there are 20 to 30 times more cases than the cases that you've actually managed to detect. You can look at the IFR again that comes out of the calculation. The IFRs here are somewhere around 0.1%, which is somewhat on the low side for most countries. And even with the, the fact that we're adjusting for the undercounting of deaths and so on, with a fairly broad confidence interval. We can do all of this for India as well. And that's the day India data. The, the top left corner is the India data for cases. It decreases a slight hump, and then the further decrease here. That's the deaths that you can see on the right-hand side. So the estimate for India as a whole is that about 40% of people were infected in the first wave of COVID-19. The infection fatality rate is about 0.1% with, with an interval between 0.05% and 0.15%. This is lower than is believed to be the case for Western populations, typically European populations, where the number is somewhere between 0.3% and 0.6%. A large part of this is just due to the fact that Indian populations are younger than European and American populations. The American median age is around 39 or 39, 40. The UK median age is about 42. Much of Europe probably is somewhere between about 40 and 45. India, it's about 28. And Pakistan is 22. Bangladesh is 27. So you can see the big difference between the sort of the relative ages and the distribution of ages in the population. Whereas relatively only about 5% of Indians are above the age of 65. That number is about 16% for the US. So even that makes a big difference in terms of mortality. The case undercounting is a factor of about 20 at the end. It was much larger initially. This is a plot of what's known about our own bands for the IFR, for the actual numbers of infected, and what's known from sero surveys, large-scale sero surveys. These are not very good sero surveys. They were only done on a small fraction of districts in India. So the number is probably more towards the center line that we've said of about somewhere around 30 to 40 percent of Indians already being infected. But that's our ballpark figure that we have. So this work is described in this following paper. Then the insights model came up with a few few days ago. It's a very detailed and long paper that describes what methods we use. It describes multiple Indian cities and the data for those cities. It describes states as a whole and India for as a whole and the various information that we can get from this modeling exercise. The second question that I want to tell you about is something called optimal testing strategy in a low and middle income context. So LMIC is low and middle income country context. So the question here is the following. India uses a combination of two tests. One is a relatively simple, easy to administer, fast test that is not very accurate. It's like a medium accuracy test. This is called a rapid antigen test or an RAT. It's also called a lateral flow test for technical reasons, but that doesn't matter. We just call it an RAT. 
The other test is a fairly high accuracy test, and this is called the gold standard test because this is the test that people use to confirm beyond a shadow of doubt that you have a COVID-19 infection. This works through a technique called reverse transcriptase PCR or RT-PCR. I simply refer, it, refer to it as a PCR test. So you have a high accuracy, expensive, delayed result PCR. You have a low accuracy, inexpensive, immediate result RAT. If I give you these two tests and you're allowed to choose the combination that you have between this, you have a fixed amount of money, so economic costs are important. You can choose to, you can, you understand that delaying the results of a test is not very good from the point of view of an epidemic. You want to ask about what is the quantum of testing? How many tests should I have altogether? How much do I mix my tests? How sensitive should my tests be? Let's assume that the RT-PCR test is an extremely sensitive test. But how much sensitivity, how much of a, of, 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 a, of a blow can I take to the sensitivity of my medium accuracy test? And first of all, finally, who should I test in the first place? So these are all questions that one can think about when one thinks about formulating models for testing. So here's the model, and here's how one thinks about it. One, of course, thinks of <clears throat> people here. People can go from home, they can go to workplaces. Whilst they fall seriously ill, they can go to hospital. And we can impose various rules on them. For example, if you're tested positive, if you're mildly, mildly positive, then you can stay at home and be quarantined. And that quarantine is leaky, that be isolated. That isolation is leaky. Potentially, with some low probability, you can, in, you can infect the people inside your house. The whole house can be quarantined. That's another rule that you can choose to apply. You can choose to follow up and contact trace on the people that this person came into contact with. You can look at hospitals. You can have pe people who work in hospitals, for example, healthcare workers, and you can ask, is there a differential amount by which they get infected compared to the regular population? If you think about this a little bit, this is actually a network. So you can think about it as defining, you know, take a network of 2,500 homes, about 250 workplaces, hospitals, choose a total of 10,000 individuals who are the links of this network. Imagine these links, the person being associated with one node, with one location, and then another node. So that's the current location is the instantaneous node of an individual. And you can update the state of the individual based on the, on the disease progression that I told you about earlier. And the probability of contacting the disease is proportional to the numbers of infected with their current location at that node. You can put in all sorts of complexity that you need. If you're severe and symptomatic, you get taken to hospital. Hospitals, as I said, have regular workers and medical staff. If someone tests positive and mild, they stay confined to home. Everyone else is quarantined for 14 days, and one doesn't do contact tracing. You can do a multiple protocol. One is just to test people at random at a certain level. This turns out to be very inefficient. The second protocol is to targeted testing. That is to test only symptomatic individuals and give them first preference. And once you finish dealing with them, then you test other people. The third is a little refinement on targeted testing where you test healthcare workers who are symptomatic, then you test the rest of the healthcare workers, then you test people who are symptomatic, and then finally, whatever you have left, you test the general population. It turns out that the first is useless. The third is basically equivalent to two. And that's, you can take that and put that information into a network model. And so you can see the numbers of, of, of recovered coming down, the numbers of infected going up. And you can track with different colors across work locations, home locations, et cetera, the numbers of susceptibles infected and recovered across this particular thing at different days. What we find is, very interestingly, that the sensitivity of the test is not particularly important. So here are a picture where you have different levels of daily testing. You test 0.1% of the population, 0.2%, 0.3%, all the way up to 1%. And what you're looking at is how many people are infected at the end of the epidemic, because that's a measure for how good your, 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 your technique for, for managing the epidemic has been. And as you increase your testing rate, you can see on the top right curve, you can see those curves come down. So at the end of the epidemic, you have reduced the number of people infected by from about, point, about 0.65 or 65% to about 40%. And you can change the fraction of the RAT, the sensitivity of the RAT, and figure out in the space of the, of, of, the, of the sensitivity, the fraction, where do you want to be? Where do you want the maximum bang for your buck? You can also put an economic cost into this and say, if my cost of the RAT versus the PCR is so much and I have so much money to spend, where can I place myself for optimal, you know, which test should I pick up of a certain sensitivity that gives me optimal bang for my buck? So there are many results here, as I said, which, which are fine to look at. The most important result in the context of India and other low middle income countries is that exactly the sensitivity of the test doesn't matter once it's beyond about 50 to 60%, but the amount that you test matters very much. And that's a crucial point that you need to make. 
You can combine tests and various sorts of non-pharmaceutical interventions. You can simulate the, the presence or the absence of, of a lockdown. You can confine people to homes and then ask. You can reduce the, the transmissi transmissivity of the disease and imagine, put that into the model and ask, how does the combination of, of NPIs, of non-pharmaceutical interventions and testing work together? And they work in a fairly non-linear synergistic manner. It's the one result that we have. So this is the paper where all of this is described. It will appear in PLOS Compio in another week or so, I think. But you can go, go and look at it on, on the archive as well. Then this has been extended in work that we're doing now to look at vaccination strategies for something that I'm sure is of great interest to any parent of you in the audience, which is what are vaccination strategies to enable school reopening and how does that work? And you can imagine extending that model to have homes, workplaces, hospitals, schools, etc. But then try to define the sort of interaction that school, school children have with themselves, have with their teachers, have with their families. Schools that are embedded in communities, there's a network structure of community interactions, there's age-dependent contacts, school children contact other school children very much more during school hours as opposed to outside school hours. You can put all of that in. This is ongoing work at the moment. The interest for me is that the structure of schools in low and middle income countries is somewhat different. They tend to be somewhat high density schools. You have multiple classes, shared ventilation, etc. Whereas the more high bro city schools tend to be low density, smaller classrooms, a little more insulated from each other. And you can ask, do things change between one setting and the other setting? And does the nature of the community interaction with the school make a difference to the, our understanding of this? This is ongoing. This is part of a project that we have with the World Health Organization's strategic advisory group on, on epidemics, where we try to understand this question of what is the nature of interventions that you can make in terms of opening schools. The last problem that I want to tell you about is the question of can you answer granular questions about vaccinations, reinfections, breakthroughs after vaccinations, and new variants, etc., using a much more detailed and descriptive models called agent-based models. You heard about agent-based models a little bit in, in Fernando's talk before this. And then the question that we've been looking at for the last year or so is can we develop such models for India which have application beyond that purely for COVID-19? So that comes to the idea of what is called Bharat Sim. Bharat Sim, Bharat, the word Bharat, for those who don't remember, is another word for India. It's a traditional name for India. Bharat Sim is a simulation program for, Bharat, for India. This is an Asian-based simulation model for disease which spread in the Indian population. It's an ultra-large scale simulation. Currently, it handles anywhere between 1 and 100 million agents, and the hope is to try and push it up even further to maybe 200 million to 500 million. But that will call for some serious computing as well as some serious reconceptualizing of the code. A very important part of Bharat Sim is called the synthetic population, which integrates data from multiple surveys, the family health the survey that was done in 2015 and again, again 2020, multiple demographic surveys, information we have about weight, size, occupational surveys, etc. And we try to incorporate this together using various techniques from ML, AI, and various other types of methods. So the synthetic population is a very strong focus of our group, of the work that we've done, to develop what is a really believable population where you best try to ensure that all the statistical properties of the real population that you might want to study. For example, the state, any, any Indian state, the state of Karnataka, the city of Bangalore, the city of Bombay, should all have the right statistical properties when they're described by the synthetic population. Specifically for COVID-19, we want to be able to put in variants, non-pharmaceutical interventions, as I said, lockdowns or, or curfews and so on, changes in people's behavior, which is something you can do with an agent-based model. Economic decisions, for example, what happens when you shut people out from the market due to an extended lockdown? What effect does that have on the decisions that they make? When What happens when you open up and so on? So here's just a slice of what that synthetic population looks like. Don't worry about it. I can't see it either. It's basically a very, very long line list. This is Agent, agent, each agent has a unique ID. They have an age, a height, a weight, education. They have, they have assigned um, no, various comorbidities. They have assigned occupation. They have an address. They have a latitude and longitude. And with this, we can build up whole cities with this particular line of work. So everything that goes into this is homes, the structures of homes, the age distribution within the homes, workplaces, what we understand between small to large work, sort of small mom and pop operations to much larger factory-like workplaces, schools, etc. All of this we can put into this. We can also put in public transportation. We haven't done that yet because these are the important things that differentiate India from a whole lot of Western cities because people interactions in highly dense situations in public transport is very crucial to understanding epidemic spread inside the country. So here's one example of the city of Pune, which is 3 million. That's a population density map that we get from, from Bharat Sim. So the visualization from the code that we generate. 
as you can see, this is, the city is broken up into many different wards and subregions, and we can look at the behavior across all of these. Here's an example of what looks like COVID-19 spread between you know, early days and late days, 21 and 42. And here the color is, represents the number of people infected. And you can see how initially you have some regions that are infected here. You can't really make out the difference in the colors. But by the time you go to day 42, day 60, you can begin to see more and more gradients in that color, more people in, in being infected, recovering, etc. So this is really what we set out to do with this. The nice thing with this is that now you can run multiple types of interesting simulation. You can say what happens if there is multiple strains. So you can take a city of about a 3 million population. You can have it go through one strain and have that come down. When you have a certain number of people infected, let's say 50% of the people infected, then you introduce a new strain that is much more transmissible. And then you can see this peak go up again and come down. You can change the properties of the, of the second strain versus the first strain. You can introduce vaccinations at some point in between. You can ask what does vaccination do to this particular scheme here? Does it matter when I vaccinate and who I vaccinate? Because over here, since it's an agent, I can define all the properties of the agents. As you saw from the synthetic population, there are agents of ages there. So I can prioritize pe vaccinating people above the age of 60 or above the age of 45. I can provide, I can prioritize people above this age of 45 with diabetes or with a chronic heart condition. And then I can look at vaccinating other people, for example, in occupations that are very much front facing, that are much at risk populations. For example, healthcare workers. I can ask how things vary across these. One thing we could do is you'll ask about what's the importance of reinfection. And that's a very important discussion in the epidemiology community today. What do we know about reinfections of COVID-19? What is the likelihood that having been infected once, you may be infected again by another strain? Are we talking about reinfections of typically 5% of the population? Can we tell what that 5% will be? How long does your immunity last? Will you, be, will you have a milder infection the second time around than the first infection? These are questions that we need to understand, as well as the question of what happens after vaccinations. So the, the last thing, as I said, Bharat Sim development is almost complete and we'll soon release it for public use. Anyone can use it to be made openly available. What we want to do is to address is to really work on the synthetic population and address the kind of very, very detailed granular questions that the government and policymakers would like to understand. What is the effect of opening up after a lockdown? For example, in a given city, a city like Bombay in India or in Bangalore or Pune, what's the effect of unlocking the country? What happens at the level of states? How should we do that? What should we prioritize for opening up? Is there something special about the Indian population that we can try and understand from data and simulation by comparing simulations at a very granular level to the actual data that exists? Very importantly, can we combine theoretical methods such as the simulation methods such as this with actual data to try and understand what are good early warning signals. Can we simulate multiple scenarios and ask where do early warning signals of a more transmissible variant, where do they turn up? How can we decide to lock down a city or a community or a local region or to prevent transport out of it, to slow down the spread of the new variant? How do we address these questions? These are all questions of public health, but they're also questions of modeling, of epidemiology, and of the sort of statistical physics that I do, and I'm sure most of you do, in the same area. So all of this development has been, so I told you about three things. I told you about the epidemiological compartmental models in SISM. I told you about network models for vaccination and for testing, and I told you about agent-based models. All of this work is with multiple people across the country and in multiple institutions. We're funded by many places, including the WHO, the, the Gates Foundation, all of our institutions, the Emphasis Foundation, etc. So let me um, sort of go back to this main picture, which is the thing that I told you about, which is the Incisim model. To tell you, Incisim is a classic epidemiological model. This is a model that has what is called compartments. It has flow between compartments, and it really relies on the use of ODEs to model the interactions between compartments. So this is not particularly granular. It's not particularly detailed, but it's usually the first method that anyone uses before they begin to, if they want to study a particular method. And the by far the fastest and most easily reconfigurable method. And it gives you the right sort of intuition for what, what might happen. For example, the old question of what happens if there is a new variant? Can we model the effects of different variants? How is the distribution of variants changing? All of this you can put into this description of the compartmental model, which is there in Incisim. You saw an earlier somewhat simple version of the disease model, the SEIR model and the SIR model. This more complicated model here helps us to understand things like the number of people who will require hospitalization, the number of deaths as a function of time, number of severe and mild infections. And these are all important because they enable 
local governments to take specific decisions regarding the pandemic. The second thing that I spoke to you about was network models in, in the context of testing. And there I explained to you that, that governments are interested in questions like how, who should we test, how much should we test, are we doing the right amount of testing, how can we check whether we have control of the current state of the epidemic. And of course, the trade-off here is often an economic trade-off that, that small states that are not very rich don't have enough money to spend on expensive high-end tests, but they may have money for larger numbers of cheaper tests that may not be so sensitive. So the question of where these trade-offs is also a political question. It's been raised multiple times. So our work points out that it, what is important is how much you test. It, it, of secondary importance is the quality of the sensitivity of the test, provided you're above 50 to 60 percent, which a good number of tests are. So that would be, again, this is something that has fed into government policy, this particular decision. And for example, the Indian Council of Medical Research now prioritizes or says that it's important to have a number of rapid antigen tests, the RAT test, so that you can just test more widely and make testing more available. The last thing that I spoke about was a generalization of a network model to include spatial degrees of freedom. That was Bharatsam. I showed you a picture of a city and different regions of the city had been colored different colors, depending upon the number of infected in those regions. These are very complicated computational models. They're, they're, they're very expensive computationally, but they have the great advantage that you can put in a lot of very detailed and very location specific information. For example, they can tell you in a way that the network models and the compartmental models cannot about the consequences of isolating a neighborhood from people from going outside. They can enable you to explore the consequences of some leakiness in that in the in, in shutting down or enclosing a complete neighborhood in that you can explore multiple versions of different variants, different susceptibilities, dependence upon age, etc. In a way that is far more detailed than you can with other types of models. So with models like these, it's so one one thing you will have noticed is that I'm not making very general statistical models statements about these. These are all very specific. All the numbers are there to describe COVID-19 and they're intended to answer very specific questions about disease and how to deal with disease. And Bharatsam is probably the, the apex of such models, the most detailed such models that you can do. But every model has its place in providing the right level of intuition, the right level of input to governments and local bodies and local organizations, as well as scientists to take the right decisions about them. So let me stop here. Let me thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take as many questions as, as might be. Yeah, Gautam, great, great talk. Absolutely. Thanks. Great talk, Thanks so. yeah. I'm just trying to figure out how to shut this off, but okay. Somewhere at the... Uh, okay, all right, I, I, I found it, I found it. Okay. So, yeah, we can start with Megha. Thanks, Gautam, for a nice talk. Um, my question is regarding uh, what we also saw in Fernando's talk, that movement is, uh, is, is, is an important factor. Did you also happen to observe in India that there might be dense regions, highly dense regions, but not so mobile? The movement is limited, and then it was easier to control the pandemic there rather than regions which might be less dense, but uh, there is high high movement. And also, no, you, did you also, yeah, did you also have these things in in your network testing models, right? So where you can also. Uh, include this factor of uh, movement? So not movement exactly, but you can restrict movement or allow movement. For example, you can say by quarantining, by isolating or restricting movement to certain subparts of the network that we can do. In the in the agent based models, it's easy to do. You can sort of shut down buses, you can shut down people moving from back, back and forth. Your question about data is networks are very important, but it's hard to isolate movement as being critical. For example, in Bombay, in the early part of, of, the, of the first wave, the people who got infected were people in slum areas at high densities. Yes. The people who got infected later, and most of the people who were infected in the second wave of COVID-19 were people who were living in the high rises next to those slums. So you had this huge distinction between you know, seroprevalence of about 50-60% of infections in the slum areas, and right next to them you had high rises where you had 20% or 25% or of people being infected. Now, as the second wave came, that got saturated, and that number went up to the level that you saw in the slum population as well. Just because the disease was much more transmissible, it was much easier to catch it, even with relatively low levels of interaction. So many things play off against each other. 
this is a more transmissible variant. It's more transmissible by a factor of about 100% or 125%. So even low levels of interaction are, are sufficient. The other thing is that I'm not completely convinced about mobility being really important because this is an airborne disease that's transmitted by respiratory route. So someone goes into a lift, stays there, coughs a lot, leaves the lift, and then you come along 10 minutes later, you breathe in that lift, you're not wearing your mask properly. That's enough. Whose mobility was important? I mean, either you, I mean, you know, there is no direct connection between your getting the disease and the person who happened. That person can infect 20 people or 30 people just because they happen to be in that enclosed space. So ventilation is more important than mobility, in my opinion, because that's really the crucial thing. And that's really how governments should think of opening up. And that's what the Indian government is hopefully doing that you open less ventilated areas, theaters, anything that is closed, much later than open areas. So I think that's, that's something that doesn't go into these models naturally, but I think that's actually the far more important question from the point of view of policy. Thank you. Yeah. Fernando? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, yeah, I, I would say just comment because you you mentioned that. I, I think it's, it's, it's this exchange of neighbors what is relevant, and also in these models you can include air or I mean basically whatever you have moved that remains an amount of virus in the air and so on. Anyway, so that's complicated model. But I want to ask you because I understand that there is a need of a detail, but also that comes also with compli complicating the models. Uh, which which are relevant and I understand for policy making, so I understand the need of um, um, politicians and people. I mean, those that that um, make decisions to to some tools at least to figure out what to do. So that I I, I fully understand. And but at the same time, as you complete, I mean, now the question is a bit of um, theoretical physicists or whatever a scientist. So when you go to those models. They, they become even even the SIR and there was some discussions about that has is a nonlinear model and then it is um, I mean as happens often with nonlinear models if you fail a bit on whatever estimation of parameters you, your trajectories in phase space will diverge and very quickly I mean basically what happens even with the weather I mean you, we know that a uh, few days ahead we the, we cannot really trust the predictions. Same for this, and, and the more get complicated, if this would be genuinely, I mean, if we believe them as a reality and we expect them to be able to forecast, to, to predict what is going to happen, I, I, I think probably is, um, is quite misleading, right? I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm not fully sure what, what's the purpose of the use of, of these complicated models. I understand the need on the, on, on the other hand, right? So I don't know. Yeah, uh, I no, guess you, you understand my yeah, question. Yeah, no, you're, you're completely right. So I view this as a hierarchy of models. There is the simplest models are the epidemiological compartmental model that are very easy to set up. You can customize it to a disease. Networks are one step up, and putting spatial structure in networks is a further step up. Every time you have to make more approximations, the computations get more difficult, and the sensitivity to parameters also becomes more, more, more sensitive. So one thing is that I tell people, never look at more than 10 days or two weeks in advance maximum. And so keep doing, only project very, very small times in advance because then you can automatically correct if things seem to go out and have a very close eye on the data and what the data is telling. For that, you need quality data. You need, you need to specify what the confidence intervals on anything that you prescribe must be. So that is something that we do. And, but now the interesting thing is we can now move back from if you understand the agent-based models well, you can ask what should I put in my, in my network models or in my ordinary epidemiological models, compartmental models, to make them better and more realistic. Right now, the only way you can impose the effects of a particular um, non-pharmaceutical intervention, such as a lockdown, is to reduce transmissivity. That's just one number that you can figure out to reduce. Are there more handles that you can have? For example, the model that I told you about had complex, complex contacts between individuals, infected individuals, it had age structure, et cetera, et cetera. Can you tweak those better if you understand what is happening in the agent-based model? Because that's the way you can actually test many things. So but, bottom but, line, I agree with you, but yeah, go on. But that, that's, that's a purpose really, because I, I can understand that you, you have to decide what to do in a situation and you may, for example, a debate in France, should these schools be closed or should be, I mean, remain open? 
Yeah. So, and, and then I guess that nobody knows exactly. For example, there was also this uh, question of you may have a probability of getting the disease if you are 15 minutes in front of one person or the other, and then there is no data to back up that stuff. So basically, there is a lot of on the air, let's say, and I think that phenomenological kind of fitting or approximation is probably a bit more fair because we, we have uh, not a detailed knowledge, not the, of the virus, of um, how it's transmitted. I mean, there's a lot of open questions and, and so on. But now, if someone has to make a decision there, I mean, those models may help to say, okay, if we set this parameter to whatever, and at least in the simulation, we observe this. So either let's close the school, let's keep it open. I don't know. You need you need a tool so that I understand. But but the, if the idea is generally, but why we one we would like this to be used for predicting when there's such a level of I mean, we I my feeling is that basically is they can be used to look backward, let's say. If you know what happened, now you can go, you are just the staff and you describe, but not to predict, you, you understand that. And, and it's, it's, it's so, you have to, be, to do it so on, on, I mean, on the fly that becomes super complicated. I mean, I, probably unfeasible, I don't know. No, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with anything that you say. I'm just saying that you're right, forecasting anything ahead is very difficult. It depends upon, you know, there is, it depends sensitively on what you have in your model, but you can improve that. We know much more about how COVID-19 transmits now than we did six months ago. So the sure. models can get better from time to time. The agent-based models are heavy, but you can put in some of this stuff, for example, airborne transmission in different contexts, in a classroom. And you can, and as I said, ne you should never pro project more than a week in advance or 10 days in advance. You should keep doing that. That way you can hope to get somewhere. And that would be my, my bottom line. The other thing is, of course, as you pointed out, you need to make policy. Someone needs to make policy. And it's better that they make policy with some understanding of what might happen. For example, school opening or not opening. What are the different versions that models can suggest? You know, with 60% probability, cases will go down in the community if you open school. That's the best that we can do. Communicating uncertainty to policymakers is very difficult. But that finally, these are questions that have to be asked. How much money should a state, how much of remdesivir should a particular state buy in the next one month? For that, you need to know how many cases it expects in the next one month. So you're unfortunately in a situation where you have to provide numbers. You have to make them the best that you can. You can't, you know, you, you can't say that, look, I, I will not do this because I don't believe that this exercise is worthwhile. There are too many uncertainties, which believe me, as a scientist, I would like to do because I recognize those uncertainties. But, un but in practice, we have to do the best that we can. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, I hate to do this, but in intro, there are other questions also, but... In interest of time, I have to uh, move on, and we can take this if we are staying beyond the next speaker. Speaker, and one thing I am convinced now that I will now go down without lift, only <laughs> up I will come. <laughs> <with it. laughs>